Good one, good one. Um, just so you know, the music is in I'm going to do the chat show, so walk around if you don't mind, because I've got a mic. That's dangerous. Um, the music you've been listening to has nothing to do with the talk. Just so you know. I just hate when people walk into an empty room, it's silent and no one can say anything and it's intimidating. I, I, I don't like that. Anyway, good morning everyone. My name is Matt Siles. Um, <clears throat> until I got this one, I didn't have a voice. So which is why I'm using a mic, so I suddenly sound like this, you know why. So, bear with me. What I'm going to talk about today is, um, I suppose, a, a, a sounding cliche and a like, talk show host, uh, a personal journey of mine through um, a quite a debilitating uh, injury to my omission. Which, in many ways, is I suppose should be called more of a dysfunction rather than uh, an injury. Um, but it's something that I thought would be useful to put down um, on paper, so to speak. I've heard since I have gone through this, I've heard more and more instances of people having injuries, and it's not just for the saxophone either, the saxophones. I've heard a lot of brass players having a lot of injury to the point where they just cannot play. So I thought it would be worth um, talking about this and I suppose if anyone, if you know anyone or if anyone here has injuries or if anyone or if any of you are going to get injuries, please don't get injured, don't get injured, it's not good. Then maybe this can serve as, as some sort of help for you, I suppose is the main thing. Um, <clears throat> so, this, it all stems from, um, sorry, go back to one, the first slide, the bottom two sentences there. Pitfall multi-tournament performance trying to be all things to all music. Now, as sax players, I'm sure I'm not the only one here, but I thank you for coming this morning. I gave a paper in Bangkok to four people, and at the end of the, um, at the end of the talk, there was two, so thank you. <laughs> please, if you want to leave, please leave. I'll try and make this as not uninteresting as possible. If you need to leave, the dwellers are out there somewhere, please come back. Um, first, it's not, you know, more than four people, and, and actually more than the first four people, four people, two people who remained are like, new and were friends of mine who came just to be nice to me. Anyway, so back to the topic again. To try and build things to all music. As Sax players, we're all confronted with um, wanting to do what we want to do, what our strengths are, what we're good at as physicians, but also what's also going to bring in the cash to pay for the mortgage. So <clears throat> I'm sure I'm not alone in um, being one of the sax players who plays a whole range of different types of music. I'm very fortunate because I just play them all because I love them. Um, and it, then it ended up that it was, it ended up being a portfolio of things that I loved doing and was able to make some money on, which is wonderful. So between all of those things, the solo recital uh, is one of them which, <coughs> if you're around on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock in the Empire Theatre, you can see the Roman Lumento play, you know, which you won't come along. That's why that's my phone number. Um, and also, uh, another recital um, I end up doing quite a lot of is with a pipe organ. Don't knock it to each other. Uh, orchestral seasons, Broadway shows, jazz groups, commercial music, cross genre, classical chamber, ensemble. So, every one of those, of course, requires a different mindset, a different sound approach, a different performance practice. Okay? So one of, one of my aims, and I can say pretty much categorically now that it was the wrong aim, um, was to try and <coughs> try and create um, a setup for the saxophone that could cater for all of those types of music. Right. Um, the idea being that. Uh, I thought it would be the most efficient way of being able to traverse the different styles of music. Um, so I 
created what I put up there originally. I use that term, please, because it's not a great term, but it's a term. The classico jazz approach. That will never make it the Oxford Dictionary, but please feel free to use it and abuse it. Um, approach to performing using the stage to consider. However, because each genre has its own set, set of performance practices, the search to be all things, to all music using this approach, combined with other things that I'm going to talk about, resulted in a muscular dysfunction or an injury, which <laughs> I'm sad to say still exists today, but you know, we're, we're working through it and I'm, I'm going to talk about how, in my case, um, I've had a lot of questions so far about this. Excellent. I love it. Alright, so this is what happened. Around about 2008, and the thing about an injury is when you have an injury, when you realise it's, it's an injury, it's, you're probably about six months down the track. Heads are nodding already. There are small signs that I didn't heed at the time. Anyway, let's call it 2008. Muscular cramps and spasms. I'm going to really, um, talk about the exact area of those as we go on. But it was everything but the omission. We're talking through here, right down here. I got myself in a real mess. And just to top it off, I thought, let's throw in a dose of tendonitis on my right arm, this one, um, which was, I think, brought up by a lot of soprano playing and a lot of baritone playing. More heads are not. Stage two, wait. Debilitating muscle cramps and spasms. It got to the point two years later where I would put my mouthpiece in my mouth and I found what I thought was my wisha and it would cl clamp up so much I couldn't get a sound. It would just hold it there. It got to the point where it was, it would basically it would be a spasm and I could not play a note. It was a good feeling, I can tell you. Then I thought, you know what, the right arm's got tendonitis, I want to share the love. Over to the left hand. So the left arm did that. So that's, that's a, a summary of the sort of things that resulted in this. Now, these days, um, depending on who you talk to, tendonitis is, some people say it's curable, some people say it's manageable. I'm going for the management. I don't know that it's curable, if someone knows a cure, please send me others, because I'd love to know. Um, so all of these things, uh, what I've done in the last four years has gone through a process of management, of resetting everything and trying to manage things. And I'll blind you with a bit of science, which frankly I don't fully understand so, to, um, to sort of explain more of the things. But what, the thing I did realize and came to realize is that the things that happen and, and this is perhaps common sense the things that happen in your life musically and extra musically they're going to have knock-on effects to to um to everything that you do and so what i needed to do was take a holistic approach to the whole thing so i needed to con consider the whole the, all of the systemic causes and effects um, everything that happens has a knock-on effect, has a, an effect on everything else that happens to you. I know I've said that three times in three different sentences, but that's how you got through. So what I did is looked at the whole range of things, and this is when I think I, I want to share what, with you what is a very honest account of everything. So that's the end point in um, talking about something, especially an injury that goes on. Can anyone, everyone hear me alright by the way? Just some of the school in the I'm sure we're quite in. Um, I, I think we need to be honest, very honest, in, in when we're talking about these sorts of things because as saxophone, like saxophonists, it's not necessarily the saxophone that defines us, we're people that haven't played saxophone. So there's all these other things that will come into play. Anyway, um, so I needed to look at physical 
mental, the psychological, and the musical components of all those things. You will get out of here before 11am, don't worry. I'm not going to look at everything. Alright. So, what I did, these are all the things that I thought, a summary of some of the things that, that I thought I'd look at. So, firstly, <clears throat> over those years, there was a lot more performances I was doing. I was doing. And a lot, of, lot more performances in a lot, a whole lot of different genres I was doing. So, I had to change quickly and a lot. Um, and again, I'm sure I'm not the only one in the room who, who is under this sort of pressure at times. Um, and as a result of that, in some circumstances, the other thing that would happen were, was an increase in the volume, actually just physical volume that I had produced in some circumstances as well. I could, a couple of examples of that. I mentioned about playing the pipe organ. It sounds weird, but it does work. The only problem with the pipe organ and playing the pipe organist is that, especially if it's in a cathedral or a basilica, a very large church, is that often the organ is up in the organ loft. Okay? And where the organist is, if, if the congregation is there, the organ is here. Either side, behind, and in front of the pipes. Now, as a saxophonist, you've got to find a spot where you can stand and heal these things because each one of those pipes is going to sound at a different time. So there's a time lag. Not only that, unlike um, the saxophone, and of course, the saxophone is very variable in intonation at the best of times, pipe organ is really not that tunable. And I did a recital, for example, I did a recital about three months ago, and we were just using the two sets of pipes. The left hand set was 435, the right hand set was 438. So I had to kind of find my way about 437.3. You know. So you've got a time lag, you've got an intonation thing you've got to try and find your way through, and the sheer volume of these things. So all of those things, as one example of the sort of things that I had to push as a saxophonist. Uh, another example in the jazz group, I played with a vocalist, a fantastic vocalist, but she didn't like hearing me in her fallback. But she liked having me next to her in front. So I couldn't hear myself. So I had to push. So I couldn't, I, I had to push and push and push. The volume was not to hear myself. So those sorts of, those sorts of factors was starting to really play, um, play havoc on my ownership. Employment changes, as we all know, when you change a job or get a new job, there's at least a 12 month settling in period. Some people say six, I reckon it's about 12. Over the course of um, four years, I had two changes at the same institution but very different roles. And, I'm, and again, I'm sure it's the same in a lot of other institutions where you don't just uh, have saxophone duties, you have a lot of others. So I was writing units of you know, everything that didn't have to do with saxophone as well as doing the saxophone. So you kind of split in what you have to do as well as getting used to the system of a new job and so forth. Uh, the doctorate, yes, I finally finished it. Um, I said to my wife that I'm not going to marry her until I finish. She's wiser than I am. We got married first. I'm very grateful for that. Then our son Felix came along. For those of you who have children, I'll just leave that one hanging. All of those things, fatigue, mental, physical, emotional fatigue, and on top of that, the psychological wear and tear, all those sort of things. So you can see I'm being very honest about these things, but these are the sort of things that will affect us from day to day. And in my case, um, it affected my uh, my performances went down, my wine consumption went up. Okay, shall I refer to you a bit later on? So what do I do about it? Well, first, I panicked. Second, I wrote an email to Dr. Murphy and panicked. And said, oh, just help me, please. And then I sat down. So first thing I did went to a my team. Okay, with uh, the tendonitis. That was good. Some stretches and so forth. 
great we saw a physiotherapist. First physiotherapist I went to, um, I will not mention names, but it wasn't as effectual as it could be, I should say. Now, my sister-in-law is a clinical psychologist. My wife is in child and adolescent mental health. So there's a bit of pressure on me to have a look at the psychological causes as well. Luckily, they are not um, uh, wiser than I am. So, I started to look into the idea of cognitive behavioural therapy, which is a system a lot of psychologists use. And um, the thing I found most useful about finding out about this was the fact that it challenges rules. So if you have an idea in your head, such as I want to play jazz, classical, avant-garde, Egyptian, whatever music, with the same read, the same path piece, the same setup, the same approach, and that's my rule, you're going to think, well, what's it resulted in? Has the result been a positive one or not? Clearly, in my case, it wasn't. So I had to challenge that rule that I made in my own head. You know, what were the things that led me to get this injury and what was my thinking process? The other thing is this idea of mindfulness. I don't know if any of you have come across it. It's a more recent thing that's been um, included in uh, psych psychological practice. Um, John Kabat-Zinn uh, is this man who's made this report this sort of four. And I'm not clearly I'm not a psychologist, as you can tell. But, so I'm going to put it in very layman's terms of what I understand. The whole idea of that is that you, if you have the problem, it's not necessarily identifying the problem. Of course you need to. But it's then accepting that you do and don't fight it. So in my case, if my mind machine wasn't working, and so I spent months and months and months sitting there and getting angry and just thinking, no, you've got to work, you've got this, you've got this performance, you've got this recording, you've got to do things. Going into this is very interesting. Because what it made me do was to say, look, I've got the problem, it's not going away, so don't fight it. Just accept the fact that you've got it, and then we can work around it. As commonsensical as it sounds, it actually can be, for some people, maybe not for everyone, a very useful tool to be able to transition. The next part of this, this is when the science comes in. I went to a, uh, a wonderful um, physiotherapist by the name of Andrew Bell, who uh, he he didn't mind me putting this up. I checked, checked with him. He's he's been the um, the physiotherapist of gold medal hockey teams uh, in Australia and uh, in the US for around um, uh, baseball teams. <coughs> really knows this thing, especially when it comes to sport. And really, as musicians, even though they're much smaller actions. We're kind of athletes, doing the same action thousands of times every day. So we are, in a way, athletes. And he's always surprised at how um, embarrassing and unfit musicians are, because we're, the demands on us are almost the same as an athlete. Anyway, that aside, he was also very jealous because he's an avid golfer, and he wouldn't want to come. I said I couldn't afford it. He's very jealous. Anyway, he was great. It was very great, and um, I'm, I'm not one to read from a paper, but if you well, just excuse me, I will read what he said, his assessment, if you don't mind. So, stay awake. Mm -hmm. I know you're there. Uh, he said, and I quote, You were having trouble with muscle spasm occurring while supplying. Occurrence of the spasm was somewhat unpredictable, that's the other part of this. And this led to apprehension as to when it will next occur, most likely at an inopportune time. Uh, Benjamin Britton's Requiem, more Requiem, when you play that? So, right, it's got that seventh, the minor seventh thing. In one performance, I think I created the major seventh and almost an octave with my own. Anyway, that was very embarrassing. I'm a bit of a around this day. History suggests that onset following a variation in technique required to change in read. It's kind of right. This resulted in greater effort being required to execute the required force to play. The assumption was that the excessive demand on the muscles required to perform the action required additional muscles to be recruited to help out. 
And this is a real key for me. Because I was pushing. Because I think you serve the man that you can push with these muscles before something else has to come in. It's like, for those who've ever done any, any gym work, there's a point where if you're doing the upright rows that you can't do it from here, you start swinging your back and part of the rest of your body gets involved. So when one, one muscle group isn't performing what you want it to do, or you get tired, then another muscle group will come in to try and help counteract so you can perform that action. Uh, unfortunately, the recruited muscles were unable to sustain the effort and aberrant muscle behaviour in a form of spasm resulted. This need could arise, could arise due to muscular weakness or poor efficiency. Weakness was, weakness was unlikely, which implied poor mechanics, leading to inefficiency in the muscle work. Palpitation exposed by gastric as the offending muscle. We're going to talk about him in a second. I figured if we looked at the factors influencing the efficiency of the gastric, we might be able to affect change. On examination, there was tightness through the masseter, stenotype mastoid, and digastric in particular. I will actually put English to these in a minute. Passive movement through the upper cervical and mid to upper thoracic joints were also restricted. As you can tell, I was in a good state. I'm going to explain all this very soon. So, we addressed the other cervical restrictions initially. This resulted in improvement in palate and jaw control subjectively. Next, we address the specific muscle tightness and overactivity through soft tissue techniques. Then we looked at the thoracic chokes and diaphragmatic control. Uh, I'll get through some of these. And amongst these are exercise and self-management techniques. Further management involves maintaining postural control through exercise and postural awareness. So, in a nutshell, I'm going to take you through some of these things. Everything from here, both sides, up. It's in a bad way. I wasn't using them efficiently at all. To the point where, um, I don't know if any of you have ever done this exercise, where you raise your, try and raise your, um, uh, what are they called? Shoulders. To, as high as you can, and you'll feel that there's a release. And it's often because all of these bits are all clamped up. They're all very much clamped up. And so just releasing this, and if you want to do it in your chairs, you're most welcome to. If I'm making it for myself, then you might as well as well. And for some of you, you may, you may be very relaxed. But for some of you, you may kind of feel or even hear a sort of tent or something cracking. If you guys are all loose, it's fantastic. It's just me that is the idiot. Okay, let's put some English to some of these things. So, the digastric muscle, I'm not going to put my mouth, my finger in my mouth and try to explain, is the one that was really causing some problems. Okay, all of these are basically chewing, mastication muscles, the chewing muscles. And it's this joint here, right there, and the digastric that were really, really tight and sore because these muscle cramps were happening. It's a bit strange, isn't it? And we shouldn't even be bothering with those muscles. But this is a sort of idea that we'll get into. Now, the next part that, that then was created was this muscle that comes down here. I tense here and here. Now, they're not meant to hold the wrong machine, apparently. Obviously, I was wrong. And so, they were overworking. So, they became inefficient. Then they couldn't work. And something else had to keep in. So, this muscle here started to spasm. And then this one led to this one here, across here, chest muscle. And that was actually pulling. Okay, so you can see that it's a little bit of a um, little bit of a fix that I got myself into, which using the muscles for everything but apparently what we're supposed to be using. I was using. So this little thing here, the diagastricus, wonderful little thing. If you put your thumb just either side, doesn't matter which one is one either side just to the side of it, you'll feel a bit of a bump. 
Okay? It's that, that, that's actually the diacash strip muscle here. It goes through here, there's two ends of it, one here that's separated by the tendon, and then goes back. We've got those on both sides. And that's what I was using to support my omission. I know, you're all thinking, when did you do? Correct. Interestingly enough, you've got this other hyoid bone, which if you have a look below the muscles, this white thing that goes across. It's a pretty very common bone, this one. It's one of the bones that is not, not attached to any other bone. But it's the thing that through, um, through evolution actually helps us to talk. Because it supports the tongue. And one of the things that I was trying to do when I was um, trying to get through finding a, the right omission shape and so forth was actually really using my tongue to try and affect change. But I think I was overusing it again. So this bone and working, it was being forced up and down too hard. Okay? Now, you're all very aware of these pictures, okay, from Larry Teal's other saxophone player. Now, this one, and this one, and this one, we've all seen. And if you haven't, look at my students, go on my book, go on look at Shame on him. The thing about this is that all the muscles of the embouchure are above the chin. Okay, the ones that we are most aware of, that we are using, arguably, I'm sure there's a study out there that disputes this in some way, are all those that exist pretty much above the chin, except anything except the mark that's at the tongue itself, of course, which a little bit below the chin or the reach or whatever times. So I was getting to the point where I was using every muscle but the muscles of the embouchure to create an embouchure. I don't know about you, that's probably not the smartest thing I've done in my lifetime. Okay. So the results of all this, of what I was trying to do, of creating this one-size-fits-all approach was that I was making unnecessary and unworkable adjustments. I couldn't work the embouchure I was using. It wasn't working. And it was becoming increasingly, increasingly unworkable. The other thing is, is that I was accepting the fact that it was unworkable. I just thought I'd have to practice harder. I just have to do more. Obviously, I'm not practicing enough, not practicing the right way, so I need to do more. And all that did was exacerbate the problem. So I didn't really assess appropriately what was going on. Um, and as a result, when I did think of actually changing a setup, a mouthpiece, a rig, etc., I couldn't affect that change because I was no longer using the ambition muscles that would it be able to handle the setup. Okay. So, what did I do about it? Quite a few things. The thing that I found really useful, I, I've, always, I've always been a big believer in slow practice. Always been a big believer. For myself. And most students have to endure me saying this every lesson. Nice smile, guys. But <coughs> I'm a smile, and by this repetition, this means that each repetition is the right one. I started life off, and I feel like I'm in, you know, a uh, saxophone anonymous here. I started my life as a flute player. I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't know. I do feel like a show your host now. Actually, worse than that, I would actually pick a little player. Um, <laughs> no, actually, just like I digress, but as I've done many times, my, when I got married, my uh, father-in-law said to me, um, you're not marrying my daughter if you play the piccolo. <laughs> I'm very glad to say that since that day, I've never played the piccolo. Which means I still have my ears. 
Anyway, I think you can flip time, I still love flip time. What I was, the reason why I thought of that is one of my flip teachers was talking about practicing. This is, you know, when I was in year 10, I think. And she introduced the idea of practicing the right way every time and not just trying to bring things around that you said, you think, you get it right. So you're creating new patterns. Of course, at 15 years of age, I didn't listen. Um, I also started doing mouthpiece and gooseneck only, not the mouthpiece by itself to start with because of the amount of pressure, but the gooseneck just freed up a bit of back pressure so that it was a lot freer. I did quite a lot of work on that. I also got, as far as the tendonitis goes, on all of my horns, I got all the keys loosened off. Um, blue steel was wonderful, but it, and it's supposed to not um, lose its tension, but it was just too tense. And the minute I did that, on all of my horns, the tendonitis just it didn't disappear. But I didn't notice it. It was almost three, four days later that it just did not exist. That was, a, that was a big one for me. Uh, releasing air into my cheeks, which is something that I, my first teacher said you'd never do. That helped. Uh, a more relaxed breathing approach. Trying to make sure that every breath there is no tension in my throat. That's something that's ongoing and is postural, especially on soprano as well. That you know, there's always those points where you have to perhaps release a bit to be able to take some in. But if you're in a hurry, you've got to be able to you know, take things in quickly, but it's got to be, it has to be no tension, which is something that I think is going to be an ongoing thing. And also, as a one for Luke, um, I'm talking with a, um, a headphone company at the moment, um, called AudioFly, about in ear monitors, um, which for, for, for commercial and, and jazz gigs and so forth, because if I'm going to continuously play, and I, and I love playing those genres, I'm not going to stop playing them, it's just it's too much part of me. But the one thing, as I said, in all due respects to singers and vocalists, I love them dearly, and not just because they get me kicks, um, is that they don't like vocalists need a lot of fallback. I need some, but they like the saxophone player to be up front with them. And so there's that, there's that compromise. So I'm talking to them at the moment about um, an in-ear system that allows some acoustic sound through as well. It's not completely closed, but there is actually some um, allowance for uh, the sound around me. So it becomes more of a real life performance in the way I hear it. Straight away, that immediately takes the tension off. I don't know if you've tried this, if you've been playing for a while and sometimes you get put off by the room you're in or the sound you're in, you put earplugs in your ears so all you can hear is yourself in a way, the vibrations and whatever sound does actually get through. And it's almost like, um, it's, it's, an, it's almost like an Indian monitor type of thing and it's quite amazing, I find, how much pressure it takes off on the show because you're not worried about the ambient sound, you're just worried about the technique, your on the show, your breathing. And that, that's, I find that's a really, really good technique. So, so taking that through to the ear monitors, I'm looking, I'm hopefully, I'm hopefully, um, I'm hoping that's the word I'm looking for, that that's going to be part of it as well. Remember that name, audio fire. It's a good name. Okay, I love the advertisements. So, the holistic approach, let's try and bring this thing together. So, to um, summarise, the tendonitis in both arms, the digastric really was the main muscle, but then led to other ones. Uh, the musical, the reassessment of practice and performance routines and patterns, the reassessment of cross genre approaches, including the setup. Um, I don't know if you'll be glad to hear it, but I'm certainly glad to hear it, that the one size fits all, in my case, is not the smartest thing to do in the universe. In fact, it is the wrong thing to do in the universe. It's something that I've tried to do and it's just resulted in 
this um, muscular dysfunction. So using the three, four different sets of mouth pieces, the three, four different types of reeds, the one or two different types of ligatures, is just so, so releasing. That's one thing I used to be able to do. I used to be able to change mouth pieces really easily to go from um, quite a close one through to something like a Lamberson, through to uh, a Link, if you will, um, through to a Mayer. I used to be able to do those quite easily prior to 2008. Um, I'm able to do that again now, just in the last six months, um, but I realise that because I've had to recreate the omission from the ground up, that now I'm using things a lot more efficiently. Now these things, these other muscles, every now and then, will jump and they will spasm. Um, which is uh, inopportune, let's just say. It's not wonderful, but at least now the whole idea of being aware of things, it makes things very manageable now. Okay, and psychological lifestyle balance, the reassessment of the idea of being all things for music particularly using the same setup. So, in typical chat show host, what can you do? Alright, I'm sure all of you do do it, but please, if there is something that doesn't feel right when you're playing, stop. You know, as much as sometimes if you've got a recital coming up, you want to cram that extra hour or extra two hours in your practice. Okay, we, we need to be able to do that somehow. But if it doesn't feel right, if there's something that muscularly is not going right, if your back is hurting, if your arms are hurting, if your neck is hurting, if your shoulders are hurting, stop. Just stop and reassess. I, remember, um, I always remember seeing Kyle play uh, Carmichael in the Australian Embassy, many years ago now, and you walked on, I hope you don't mind me talking about this, and <coughs> I think you played on a stool on Soprano. And it was, I, I think back to that, I think, for whatever reason, so I probably should have checked with you before I do talk about this, that's really smart. It's really smart. So if you're playing a, a fairly taxing piece on Soprano, you need you need to be able to rest your body at some stage. And I've tried that, um, thanks to you, in a recital with a pipe organ, and actually made a big difference. Made a really big difference. So things like that, I think the rule is that we stand up with or without um, stand and we perform. But perhaps we should challenge that rule if, it's, if, it, doesn't, if it doesn't fit us as performers. Maybe we there's some other way that can still adhere to a performance practice that actually helps us play. Yes, I digress again. Solace in the forearms, forearms, or upper arms, please. It, by the way, if you get soreness here, that can actually contribute to leading to tendonitis. So don't, don't ignore that one. Okay? And if there's a, um, a knot in your shoulder blades or in your shoulders, Get someone to get a mallet off it. Well, maybe not a mallet, but a hammer perhaps. Get someone to work it out because that can very easily lead to soreness here and soreness here and it can start to How many of you, any of you ever had tendonitis? That's one too many. That's one too many. Just to let you know, it's really debilitating thing. There's a point where I couldn't shake someone's hand. If I shook their hand, I didn't have the strength to actually hold on to their hand. The, the muscles tended to actually pull them away from the bone because the muscles so cramped up like a, like a ball. So I had to get the muscles back into shape. Anyway, don't ignore those signs. If your posture is uncomfortable and not comfortably upright, all of a sudden made something differently, please be aware of that. Use the mirror. I don't know if you like me, I hate looking in the mirror myself. It's not my favourite thing at all. But, you know, have a look at yourself side on, as well as front on, and see what's happening with your shoulders. One of the first things that my physiotherapist got me to do 
So when you're about to play, and I do this on, on a stage that I remember, it's roll your shoulders back. Straight up. Especially if, you, if you're playing baritone too. That monster of a thing. One of the instrument that, you know, so much weight there. But one of the first things you do now, the minute you do that, suddenly you're opening all of this up. And your body starts working the way it's supposed to work. I think that's the real key to it. To try and get your body back into the position <coughs> where it will work at its most natural. And that were one of the things that contributed to all of this cramping up for me. Uh, if there are signs that the posture and part of it, stretch before or during after. Believe it or not, we really are athletes. Doesn't matter how much time you spend at the bar, that's fine. But we really are athletes. We do the same action, even if it's that. We do that how many thousands of times a day? Just that. Now, if it, you know, on a bigger scale, an athlete would be, it might be the bottom of their leg as, a, as, a, as an analogy. But we are doing things physically, and then we have a whole breathing thing as well, and posture. We are doing things that are very much like an athlete. So we need to be so careful and follow what athletes do in many ways. Um, just going to put a pain persists, you see that one. Don't delay, and of course, this is one for my students. I'll move on. Okay, just to finish up with. My view is that when we have something like this, and I, th I think it's this whole mindfulness idea, is we don't necessarily think I have to, I have to fix and to cure it, so it will never happen again. <laughs> I hope that would happen. I pray that that would happen one day. It hasn't happened yet. But the management, management of it, I think, is what we really need to, to be comfortable with. To say that there is, in my case, there is this muscular spasm that happens. There is this muscular tightness and overworks that happens. I'm, I've got strategies that I'm going to try and use to manage it and not always just go for the cure. Take time off playing. This is one of the hardest things I ever did. I took two weeks off not touching the instrument. By the end of the two weeks, but by the end of the first week, I was actually quite happy. I was thinking, maybe I don't have to pick up again. You go and get a job. Pick up a real job. Fantastic. I always want to be a, funny enough, physiotherapist. Oh, I'm not going to do it. And then the second week, I was antsy. I was really antsy. I needed to play. And that was good. That was a nice having that feeling because for a couple of years there, I was struggling with, I have to play, I have to play, I can't play, I hate this thing, it's not working, I have to play, but I can't play, but you've got to keep playing. At the end of two weeks, I was thinking, yeah, saxophone's not bad. Don't mind it, really. It's quite good, it's a bit of fun. It's quite nice. And that was a nice point to me. And so now, regularly, I take a week or two off in the year and just don't play. Just leave it alone. I got to say, it's nerve wracking when you sort of then got a few days before you've got to play again, but it's really worth it. And this last one is this, this is my little I don't be true, I know Shakespeare always comes with the things. But in my case, I was, I got myself into to the situation where because I loved playing all these types of music, I was trying to find a way where I could best be able to do it. And got to the point where I was trying so many different things um, to try and cure everyone else's approaches to try and cure and everyone else's idea of playing um, jazz or classical, you know, starting from this point and throwing it into this sort of thing, that I kind of lost what I was trying to do and I wanted to do. So that was one of the, the processes for me to try and try and re-establish again what I want to do. And I always felt very selfish, thinking, oh, well, I want to do this. But, you know, it's like we're here for a reason. I feel like I'm about to preach here. But we're here, we're here for a reason. And we've been given talents and we've been given these opportunities and these things that we have a desire to do. We love playing this music or this music or this music or this ridiculous folk horn called a saxophone, right? It's a wonderful instrument. We just have, we love playing it. So whatever way that we want to play it, 
we need to make sure that we're true to ourselves, that we will do that in a way that actually works. And I think I'll leave it there, really. Are there any questions about any of this? Or any comments? Yes? Uh, I hope it's not too personal, but how old were you in 2008 when all this kicked off? 13. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm partly still an Australian time. Yes. Uh, that was, I was 36. So yeah, you probably really started when I was about 34. And were you playing other instruments aside from the saxophone? Because you mentioned you were a piccolo. <laughs> not playing piccolo. <laughs> I did not play piccolo. Um, flute and clarinet. Um, I'm a really average clarinet player. I don't enjoy it. I shouldn't say that film too much. Um, and I, I did the Phantom, Phantom Season, which is a, a flute and clarinet chair. I don't think that helped. The flute was fine, but with the added back pressure of the clarinet, I don't think that helped things either. How many months was that season? It's only about three. Uh, it wasn't a huge season, but long enough. You know, you're doing full time work and doing that as well. Any other questions? Does anyone, anyone here know people who've been injured or have omission injuries? Okay, a couple of things. All right. Hopefully, it would be great. Um, I, I don't know if I you know, present this evening, it would be interesting to people who want to hear it. But hopefully, if I ever ask that question, I really hope that people say no. And there'll be no injuries because it's, it's a very difficult thing. And I know people who have given up. I was very close to giving up and saying, this is it, I'm, I'm not doing this anymore, I can't do it. You know, life, I've got one chance at life, I'm not going to mess myself around so much by doing it. I'm glad I had it. Um, it's because it's, it's fantastic to do what we do. But it's, uh, it can be a bit difficult. Yep. Now, I had a question. Um, just to be succinct, to change, you still are doing all of those um, genres? You've just changed the way you've gone back to basics again and you change your mouth <coughs> for each one. That's what I got from what you were saying, is that correct? You can give the next talk. <laughs> You're I took 40 minutes just to say that. <laughs> it's like a doctor, isn't it? You've got one sentence to say in 100,000 words. You just said the same sentence 33,000 times. Yes, I took a year off playing a lot of recitals. This goes back now a year and a half ago and just stopped playing recitals, especially, and carved the amount of jazz gigs I was doing. In the last 12 months especially, I've built up again, um, and have, and have enjoyed it again. Um, but yeah, I'm not stopping doing, which is that whole thing about to that own self being true. Um, I've, I almost did. I thought, no, I, I enjoy it too much. I think that's an important message. If nothing else, that's the most important message I think today is that it is your passion and you don't give up on your passion. So well done, mate. Good job. Well, I did help. <laughs> I uh, did want to um, point out one of the things that you did talk about. I worked with a physical therapist in my university who mm. said that, that the musician's problems usually start happening either when you first enter college because you're increasing the amount of playing that you're doing or around the time of your senior recital, or in graduate school, you would see those kind of landmarks. And so I think a lot of it is when you increase the amount drastically of what you're doing, you have to be very careful that you're not picking up bad habits or doing mm. things incorrectly, and then that's where the problems are. And the whole idea of transitioning in, in life, in, you know, whether it's be the different stages in your career or whatever else. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks everyone for coming tonight. You, I think you quadrupled the number of people that, that listened to me in Bangkok. Um, I think this is much more interesting than what I talked about in Bangkok, to be honest with you. But thank you everyone for, 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 um, for coming on, having listened and indulging me. If I'm really happy to have a talk to you, if you've got any things, myself or uh, Jackie. Jackie, who sounds like she's been through a similar sort of thing, would be really happy to talk to you. Thanks, everyone.